after hearing this data, so um, just taking a deep breath for a minute. Um, okay, it's my great pleasure to be here this afternoon to be a part of this just magnificent conference. I am just so delighted to have been part of this. The past two days have been inspirational. I feel like it's been a call to action in so many ways, and it's just my pleasure and my great honor to be here. So I'm Anna Bredo Lanza, as was mentioned earlier in the introduction section. I am very happy to tell you about some of the work that I've been engaged in relevant to the great theme of this conference, which is urban health and communities. So I am going to focus my talk this afternoon on some issues that I've been very interested in over the past few years, um, not Latino communities, how communities are, um, how we could rethink what communities are and how communities influence a process that I'm very interested in, and that is acculturation, the process by which immigrant groups and other groups adopt the attitudes, behaviors, and um, norms of host, the host culture. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of what the purpose is this afternoon. I am going to go over very quickly the Latino population in the United States. Uh, if you are familiar with this, I apologize, but I think it's very important that when we talk about Latinos, we understand what that population is. Um, I want to let you know that the Latino health profile is actually quite mixed. There are some great outcomes related to Latino health, some not so great. I want to then tell you about a group of Latinos, Dominicans, that constitute the fifth largest group of Latinos in the United States, but we don't really hear too much about that group. I will give you some highlights of some work that I've done with regard to the Dominican population in New York City, and then I'll talk about neighborhood level variables that we've looked at. I will talk about acculturation and some of my ideas related to where this field can go, and I look forward to talking more about during the discussion about new and bold ideas to move this field forward. So who are the Latinos in the United States? Um, Two-thirds of all Latinos are identify as Mexican. The next largest group um, actually are Central and South Americans because that group sort of gets pushed in as one large group. But actually, if you think about the next group with regard to specific area of nationality, it's Puerto Ricans. So Puerto Ricans are the next largest group, followed by Cubans. And then the, we have this other group of uh, other Latinos. Well, other Latinos, this is where uh, Dominicans come in. And also with regard to Central and South Americans. Actually, Salvadorans are the fourth largest group of Latinos in the United States. This is another group that we don't hear much about. And we heard from the talk yesterday um, from Dr. Hernandez that actually there's great migrations from these areas that we really, we really don't hear too much about. So just think about this. We, we're talking about very different nationalities, migration patterns, patterns of acculturation. And if you think about migration patterns and nativity status, what we just heard about in terms of who is U.S. born and who is not U.S. born, I hope that this slide um, makes clear that there are some stereotypes out there. There are only about a third of Mexicans in the United States are not born in the United States. It's only about a third. The vast majority are U.S. born. Salvadorans, however, almost um, two-thirds of all Salvadorans are, quote, foreign-born, meaning not born in the United States. So right away you see um, patterns that could influence access to things like health insurance and citizenship, things that are given only to the rights of American citizens. So think about the different nativity status demographic characteristics of the various Latino groups. 
And because this is a conference on urban health, I also think it's important to consider where Latino groups live, where they cluster, and possibly reasons for these areas where Latinos tend to cluster. So this slide shows you that especially in the southwest areas of the United States, um, there are more Latinos in certain areas. And it is not an accident that there are more Latinos in certain areas of the United States. Many of you might remember your American history. Um, California was actually Mexico at one point. New Mexico was Mexico. Texas was Mexico. And I, I sometimes joke, why are there so many cities in Los, An Los Angeles named after, you know, Spanish? That's because that used to be Mexico. Uh, so let's not forget, this is their hist historical influences in terms of where people end up. This other slide I love because it demonstrates that depending on which city you talk about, there are the proportion of groups are not differentially distributed. So for example, in Florida, it's predominant, the largest groups are Cubans living in certain areas. Uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, it's predominantly Salvadorans. Um, Rhode Island, many of you may not be aware of this, the largest Latino group in Rhode Island are Dominicans. So just think about different patterns of migration and where people end up. So as you see already, Latinos are... Uh, uh, there's a mixed profile in terms of nationality, and also there's a mixed profile in terms of health outcomes. So there are higher rates of obesity and diabetes among Latinos relative to non-Latino whites. Uh, we know that Latinos as a group have a lower mortality rate, also known as the Latino mortality paradox. There are reasons for that. I don't have time to get into that this afternoon, but it overall reflects the observation that relative to whites, Latinos have lower mortality than you would expect. But the generality of this paradox varies, right? As I just show you here, diabetes deaths are higher, there's higher rates of obesity, and we can talk about the process by which acculturation might influence better or worse health outcomes. So let me get to the main emphasis of my um, talk this afternoon, Dominicans. Why have I been focusing on Dominicans? As I mentioned, they are the fifth largest group of Latinos in the United States. Almost half of all Dominicans live in New York City. There is a lack of research on Dominicans and given different political context, historical context, urban health context, I think it's very important to study the culturation in context. And so I engaged in this program of research looking at a variety of different health outcomes and urban health related issues focusing on Dominicans. This conference is on urban health. And if you are aware of research on neighborhood determinants and urban health, there is this tendency to see neighborhoods that are predominantly black and brown as havens of risks, havens of you know, low income, poverty, and we all know that these factors are very detrimental to health. But a different way of thinking about this is in terms of a sociological approach that considers ethnic enclaves as sources of resource, resources. And there is some growing recognition that maybe there is an advantage to living in these barrios, areas where there are predominantly co-ethnics just like you. So I was very interested in, in sort of turning this research a little bit on its head and looking at are there benefits to living in these areas. So let me just give you some really quick highlights. In the interest of time, I'm going to go through this very quickly. So as I mentioned, the risk literature tends to have these sort of assumptions that neighborhoods are um, averse. They're, they're, yes, it's true that there's high... Uh, density of liquor stores, um, residents pro per perceive low social cohesion, there's 
reduced walkability in some of these areas. There's, there's worse safety, reports of high perceptions of crime. But another way of looking at this is maybe there are benefits to living with co-ethnics. Maybe there are linguistic and cultural bonds that um, promote social cohesion, that promote resource sharing, information. And maybe there's an availability of culturally adapted goods and services that you will not find in other areas. And a sociologist by the name of Mario Small has argued that sometimes in these ethnic enclaves, there are what he calls resource brokers. There are, for example, um, places where you drop off your kids that are places that you exchange information. And because you speak the same language as other parents, you share information that you would otherwise not have. So we embarked upon this program of research uh, looking in at a, c a couple of communities that we defined as Dominican enclaves versus not, and we differentiated between social, uh, sorry, cultural resources such as botanicas, and we heard from a colleague yesterday when he visited a botanica, botanicas have very interesting cultural resources. There are also hair salons that cater to women that have certain hair types, and these are considered culturally appropriate resources because they, 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 they signal a sense of belonging in this neighborhood, that we provide a resource that is important to you as, as women, as men. And so we differentiated between social, structural, and cultural resources. Structural resources you're very, very familiar with. These are things like banks. They just facilitate life. So what we did very quickly, I'm going to run through this. We, um, we predicted that in these enclaves, you would see low, greater numbers of structural and cultural resources. Here's how we did it. We identified two areas, Washington Heights and the Bronx. We selected 10 tracks with the highest percentage of Dominicans in these two areas in New York City. And we actually did street level, street level observations. We did not do Google Maps, and I will explain. This was a newer technology than when we originally did this work, but I will tell you that there are some benefits of doing the old-fashioned clipboard observations, and I'll get to that in a minute. So we, we looked at uh, 120 um, streets in Washington Heights and 74 in the Bronx. All together, we sampled 20 tracks. So this is what we coded, risks, bars, fast food establishment, liquor stores, structural resources, clinics, supermarket schools, cultural, Dominican hair salons, Hispanic restaurants. These are just examples. We did this only during daylight hours because we were interested in physical structures, not social. And we had teams of coders that went out and did this. So very quickly, this is an example of census tract 261 in Washington Heights. These are the tracks that we randomly selected, and this is where we did the coding. So what are the, some major findings from this study? We found that relative to the Bronx, Washington Heights, which we define as an ethnic enclave, had similar numbers of risks and cultural resources, but there were more, more structural resources in the uh, ethnic enclave. So what did we conclude from some of this work? Well, the lack of association between ethnic enclave status and risk contradicts research that identifies these areas as havens of risks. We think that there's a lot more work to do with regard to the, how we are communicating to the communities that we serve and in which we practice when we only focus on the negative rather than looking at the positive things in these communities. We also think that the, um, the association between ethnic status and, and resources supports the benefits of possibly um, resource brokers and possibly having advantages, resources that we don't always look at. So having said this, 
I think that it's important for us to consider thinking about what these neighborhoods offer. We've talked about this during this conference over the past two days that the idea of neighborhoods possibly providing resources, what does it mean when these neighborhoods start becoming gentrified? I have just one minute left, so I'm going to say that there is some evidence that Washington Heights is starting to become gentrified, and I just want to encourage you to think more broadly about how neighborhoods are shaping health and the political and social context in which um, people are living, uh, forces that maybe are shaping who moves into communities and what this means. So rather than telling you a little bit more about some of the health behavior outcomes that we looked at, I think in the interest of time, I'm actually going to stop and I look forward to hearing more questions about how we should be conceptualizing acculturation within context. And we have much more to say about this in terms of tools and outcomes. So thank you very much. I am out of time, and I am looking forward to the discussion. Thank you.